Thank you. Well, first of all, um, I'm, I'm delighted to be sort of part of this meeting and it's a pity we can't host you uh, in person, but I think we can hopefully give you a sense of what we're doing in the UK. Um, the UK has been a kind of uh, a huge supporter of the Beyond of the One Million Genomes Initiative. I think we were one of the signatory countries and our ministers were uh, extremely supportive of that. And, and I think we'll, we'll now work out the best way that we can collaborate in the longer term. Yeah, so just to give you a very quick overview, because we have some actual experts from both um, this England, uh, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland speaking to you later. But I'll just give you a very quick overview, trying to keep to time. Um, the the history of, of genomics and genomic strategy in the UK goes back probably a decade, but in particular, uh, when we were asked by the Prime Minister to deliver a major project, the 100,000 Genomes Project, um, uh, in, in December 2012. And this is just a very quick overview, but I think what I would highlight is it's taken a few years to get started um, from setting up Genomics England in 2013 through to starting the sequencing uh, in, in, in earnest in, into the 2015, 2016, but also to, to, to the way that in parallel with that, we've been doing uh, the policy work that underpins the, the, the uh, program beyond 100,000 genomes. And in particular, we've been very keen to uh, uh, what we always felt was we, it is important to to hit the target but not miss the point. We had to understand why we we're doing 100,000 genomes. I think the other thing to highlight here is that if you can see these diagrams, we've actually had extremely high level political support. Two prime ministers have been closely involved with the project. Uh, both of our uh, health secretaries at the time, uh, Jeremy Hunt and Matt Hancock have been very, very passionate supporters of the project. So I think it, it helps us to have a high level political support, but it also puts extra pressure on as well to, to actually deliver uh, and to be seen to be constantly evolving this. So the, quest, the question I think we really had at the, uh, at the very outset in doing our, uh, our, um, our policies and strategies was that you know, we, we didn't see uh, how whole genome sequencing fitted into the uh, health service. It didn't seem to have a lot of utility, it's expensive, slow and of limited use, but there were tantalizing glimpses from research projects. So the questions we really had in the 100,000 Genomes Project were how to catalyze uh, the development of uh, the adoption of uh, whole genome sequencing and genomics generally into the health service and how can we actually do that in a way that builds on the strengths as well of the research community. Um, I think in parallel with that uh, in, 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 in similarity to another, a number of other countries we had a real desire to do some work around rare diseases to actually understand the impact of rare diseases on families on the health service and the opportunities uh, to improve diagnosis and, and treatment. And so this has been very much worked up in parallel with our first UK rare disease uh, uh, strategy uh, and now subsequently with our rare disease uh, policy framework. Um, rather than go into the detail, which I think uh, Mark Caulfield will cover uh, shortly, I just wanted to sort of highlight uh, that, that last September we published a 10 year strategy called Genome UK. Uh, it's very hard to read this, but, but basically we looked at some of the key areas of strength in the UK, particularly around some of the infrastructures and platforms uh, that exist. Uh, Genomics England, the 100,000 Genomes Project and the NHS Genomic Medicine Service. What is now called Our Future Health, which is a, a brand new 5 million uh, 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 genotyping cohort looking at uh, early disease detection. The UK Biobank, which is, I think, uh, widely regarded as an excellent resource for, for research, and the NIHR Bioresource, which is, again, another excellent resource, probably less well understood. So these, are we think, are the, the underpinning backbone of a future genomic health strategy. We've set up uh, in the strategy uh, three what we call pillars. One is on diagnosis and personalised medicine, one on prevention and one on research, and they, they interact and overlap in a in, a, in a, a number of areas, but also underpinning those are some important elements of engagement, workforce development, uh, the link to industry and the link to supporting uh, commercial developments in this, in this field. Uh, the key point of maintaining trust and public confidence through ethical frameworks, and then delivering coordinated approaches that cut across both data analysis uh, and, and uh, healthcare. So all of these things are now uh, uh, being overseen by what we call the National Genomics Board, which is, I guess, the nearest thing we have to a National Mirror Board uh, to, to, for, for the, the purposes of the B1MG discussion. Um, I won't dwell on this slide, but I can send you the link if you're interested, but we have done some major public dialogue on <coughs> genomic medicine, in particular, looking at the expectations that participants and patients have 
about what they will do for the health service effectively by volunteering, what they expect the health service to do for them, and crucially, what they expect uh, the system, the government, not to allow. Uh, and that obviously includes some of the key areas of red lines that you could imagine about insurance uses, about surveillance, uh, and about uh, things like eugenics and genetic engineering. So we've got this very interesting uh, balancing act to do between uh, adopting the kind of positives that the, that the public think and, and also preventing the negatives. And I can go into more detail about that if anyone's interested. So now we're moving as, uh, into Genomics England's uh, role in this activity. And I think that sets us up for uh, Mark's talk. Um, but Genomics England now has a vision where everyone benefits from genomic healthcare. We see this uh, operating through what we call the infinity loop where uh, Genomics England supports some of the NHS services in terms of providing whole genome sequencing, but also uh, there is a process for consenting patients to actually have their data made available for researchers. And that's the flow that moves from the left to the right in data. And then in, in sort of uh, taking that uh, principle around sort of solidarity and reciprocity, we expect our researchers to work on the, the genomes and for data to be fed back, for insights to be fed back as quickly as possible to improve care. So this is the kind of infinity loop of a constantly evolving healthcare service. And I think we've seen evidence of how that can work in the 100,000 Genomes Project. Now we're sort of making it part of the core business of Genomics England working with the NHS. Um, I think having the, uh, the capabilities that we developed for the 100,000 Genomes Project and having an organization like Genomics England has allowed us to pivot very quickly to face the challenge of, of COVID-19. So in very uh, short order, Mark led us into a major collaboration with a, uh, an existing project called Genomic and working with Illumina to uh, set up a, a project to sequence 20,000 severely ill patients from ITUs and 15,000 mildly affected patients, and also to match those against controls from the 100,000 Genomes Project. And this is a kind of project we, we've, we've felt to be a very useful um, uh, demonstration of the capabilities you can have if you have a sort of system that we have in, in the UK. And that's moving at pace. And maybe Mark can talk a bit about the insights from that. And then coupled with that, and I think it's probably beyond the scope of this meeting, but it's increasingly important to our political leaders, is the work we've done on pathogen sequencing, in particular, uh, the work of the COVID Genomics uh, UK Consortium, a research, mostly research funded, but with very tight links into all four of our public health agencies, a network of laboratories across the, um, across the UK, uh, and, and a very uh, well-honed process for feeding samples to the sequencing centres and data to the central database. And then and most importantly, to feed those data into uh, the global GISAID database. And I think the UK has contributed something like 35% of all of the COVID genomes in the, in the global database. And that's, again, a very important uh, part of the uh, landscape. And I think we'll be seeing some new announcements about the, the long-term future of that, possibly later this week, or certainly from the beginning of next month. Um, and so I think just to finish off, uh, obviously we recognize the importance of uh, global networks here. We're, we're kind of all familiar with some of the publications looking at the, uh, the number of national programs uh, uh, globally. Uh, we've got an especially uh, strong link with some countries. Uh, France is one of our uh, earliest partners. And that picture in the top right shows our minister, if you've got excellent eyesight, uh, Lord O'Shaughnessy at the, signatory, uh, the signature of the One Million Genomes Initiative. But also we allow our data to be accessed by researchers worldwide. We have something like three and a half thousand researchers, probably more now, 400 institutions that can work in collaboration with the, uh, the GZIP data, the Genomics England data. So this is, I think, uh, an opportunity for us to reflect uh, now about what we're doing in the UK, but also how that can network across Europe and beyond uh, uh, to, to really uh, get the maximum benefit from all of this genomic activity. Um, so as I say, that's a very, hopefully a very quick oversight of what we can be discussing over the next uh, two mornings. And uh, I, I think that's maybe hopefully set us up for a more detailed discussion from uh, both Mark Crawford and or the other colleagues from Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. Thank you very much.